Um, the speaker, let me introduce the speaker. The bio is absolutely amazing. Um, Sibu Mapena is in the building. Let's show some love. Let's show some. She's in the building. All right. So for those of you who don't know who Sibu Mapena is, I'm just going to take snippets from Ipofaliake, what she's done. Um, in her personal capacity, I don't want to get too much into the story. Otherwise, I'm ruining, you know, her presentation. But in a personal capacity, Usibu continues to work behind the scenes on some of the biggest urban events in South Africa as a consultant utilizing a different skill sets, namely marketing, choreography, creative direction, artist lineup curation, and event consultation. Listen to this and some of the events that she has worked on. Casper Nyovest, fill up the dome, fill up Orlando Stadium, fill up f &B Stadium, Black Coffee's Music is King, and uh, Channel O's Lockdown House Party, just to name a few. And some of you may have seen her, right? she's, but she's behind the scene. Yeah? Uh, in, two, in 2020, 2020, I was about to say, in 2020, Sibu was chosen as one of the judges of Gauteng's Premier Service Excellence Awards. So she is here under her company, Duma Collective, and uh, it's a creative communications agency that services F. MCG brands, event production companies, creative, and other agencies, performing artists as well as government departments in South Africa and the rest of Africa. Employing seven people, you got more? No, she's <laughs> She's employing 32 people now. And uh, I'm going to introduce Bulelani, who's going to run this Mbaula chair to find out more about her her story. Sibu, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to show you some love. Is our host ready? Let me, let me, let me bring Sibu onto stage, but please can we get up? Show the same love that we showed Will Inga. Come on, let's show some love. Let's show some love. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to the one and only Sibu Mabena. Yeah! Thank you so much. Please do have a seat. Guys, I won't lie. This is hella weird. Hey, I'm the behind the scenes girl. I'm not like, make noise for us. We're we, like, we showing you some love. We're showing you some love. It's very awkward. All Bye. right. <laughs> Thank you, Sibu. Um, I do no need. No need for love. <laughs> Show some love for Bulalani. So, 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 He's the visionary. He's the reason why we are here. So please, can we show him some love? Yeah. Mr. Get Things Done. Mr. Get Things Done. Mr. I'm Get Things Done. Show some love. Thank you. Over to you. <laughs> Dude, you're hectic, eh? You, you, you disrupted things. <laughs> Look at how many people you got out here. <laughs> Hi. Oh, man, um, sure. Give it up for Sibu. No, stop giving up. Give no, it up for Sibu. <laughs> and shout out to Inga, um, an amazing, amazing entrepreneur. Is Inga still here? Yeah, yeah, still here. That's so why doing an interview. Um, so, yeah, in winter. In winter. To see you guys. You're right. I think um, people just want information. Hey, yeah. like the youth are not lazy. All we want is information and access to the market. So this is testament to that, that. If people just gave us the information and gave us the access to the market, we wouldn't be here, we'd be working. That's very true. That's very true. So, man, to kick off, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, so I think, I, so I read your bio, we, we follow each other on social media, and at some point you, you posted something about you were dancing. Um, <laughs> so, strangely so, right, a couple of years ago, me and a friend of mine, Junior, did some crumping. Well, obviously, it didn't work out clearly <laughs> for me. But I mean, it's so interesting how 
people's journey almost becomes so intertwined. But I mean, I read through your bio. Your bio is amazing. I mean, I read through your life on a consistent base, and you've consistently, you know, been an inspiration to a lot of young people, a lot of us, including myself, right? How, how, how at what point did Duma Collective come about? Because I think one of the most significant points in my life, I guess, when I met you was where you were doing the fill-up. And I think you had gotten to a point where you were sort of narrating the journey of how you grew and how you grew year on year, how your roles have grown year on year. But that sort of leaves someone who's got an enterprising sort of mentality. Where did that come from and where did that spark initially took off? Ooh, okay, Sanborani, because I didn't greet you guys. I'm so sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so yes, I started out as a dancer. Um, I did ballet, tap, hip-hop, um, and where the enterprising thing comes from, I come from a family of entrepreneurs. Um, my parents were in exile for 17 years, I think, and when they got back, my dad, seeing what was happening in the ANC at that time, back in 1991 is when they got back, and that's when I was born, he decided to go into business, and he started a security company. And my mom instead went and worked for the ANC, funny enough, um, at some point, they got divorced. I think I was four when they got divorced. Um, my sister, who's 17 years older than me, um, graduated from varsity, and she started a catering company. Um, whilst the catering company was flopping, my dad opened a gun shop, so she went to go work at the gun shop. I'm growing up at this time, so after school, he'd catch me. When it's his weekend to take me, we'd go to the gun shop. He'd make me count bullets in the boxes to keep me busy. <laughs> and it's like, but the boxes, there are 100 bullets in the box. And he says, yeah, but white people can still cheat you. Doesn't matter what it says on the box, count those bullets, you know? So I think he was teaching me how to work. Yeah. My mom, who was a nine-to-fiver, on the other hand, dedicated. Um, she worked from the ANC, from Mandela's office, actually, she went into GCIS, which is Government Communication and Information Services, and she was an HR person there. And I would see her working nine to five, waking up every morning, driving to Pretoria, because we lived in Berea, which is in between Tobro and Yeovil. And she, as a single woman, raised me with my dad playing a role, because fathers play roles, they don't necessarily <laughs> raise <laughs> us. <laughs> um, I think I saw her dedication to her job, where she was getting paid one salary. Then I saw my father's dedication to building a business and employing over 300 security people and running his business. And the combination of both is what um, I think cultivated this person who is a crazy hard worker, but someone who wants to create employment for other people and use what she has to help others. Um, and then... I also took what I loved to do because my dad was big on do what you like um, and mixed all of that up and that's how Duma Collective became what it is today. It's a very, very funny, weird story that won't make sense to anyone, but if you just dig deep, you'll find the nuggets in there. <laughs> <laughs> but now take me, to, take me back to, I mean, so now at that particular point, you're working on this project, right? Um, and I think, I think how you sort of narrate how you got in and how your role sort of grew year on year. Just take us through that, right? Because I think essentially what a lot of us what a lot of what a lot of us don't do is we get into a space but don't maximize opportunities and don't look at the opportunities that look at all the things that are growing up. Okay, so let me let me take it back a little bit. Um, from being a dancer, so dan dance is a very show off kind of sport. You know, you, you are performing all the time. You're always on. You're always trying to make people like you for what you're doing. And in that, I exported that into my schoolwork. So with my schoolwork, I always wanted to be top 10. in the school hall. Because if I didn't perform well at school, my mother was going to trip about the dancing. Because every day, it's dancing after school, blah, blah, blah. So I had a point to prove at home and a point to prove at school. So that... Doing that over time, you know, trying to repeat that excellence, trying to repeat that feeling of satisfaction which I've achieved, I took that into all my freelancing work. So when I was 16, um, I volunteered to do events for Masters of Rhythm, which is a dance job. And I think in that, I started seeing other opportunities of, oh, okay, an event actually has security, has jock. You know, there's things that you've got to apply for ahead of time. 
and then there's the marketing, and then there's the actual dance crews that have to enter, and then there's the actual staging, and all the like cool stuff that people see, but there's so much that goes into the event. And I only saw that because of my access, because of my volunteering, putting my hand up to say, I want to learn. So fast forward to the fill up story. I used to work at the Sands, which was a bar in Phantom. How I got my job at the bar, I was friends with DJs. So I would go to the Sands every week with them, and they were getting paid to be there, and I was just like, I'm here drinking ciders and beers, but these ones are getting paid. Ah. <laughs> so I asked their boss, the owner, I was like, Alan, dude, I'm here every weekend. Um, can I be a bartender? Can I just like get a job? I'll be a door girl, bartender, something. And he's like, cool, we pay 200 rand a day. If you want it, you can have it. I said, may as well, because I'm getting nothing now. They tell me it's better than nothing. And whilst I was there, social media was on the rise. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And I noticed that the Sands didn't have social media pages. So I said, Alan, um, can I run the social media pages? He said, I'm not going to pay you. I said, fine. I just want to run the pages. But what running the pages meant was that every brand that comes to do an event or every promoter that comes to do an event has to deal with me because I must promote the event. So now I'm dealing with brand managers from SAB. I'm dealing with DJs. I'm dealing with artist management. One such artist manager was Tilly. Tilly, who used to manage Casper. Casper's first big gig, not even big, but first gig in Joburg, I believe, was at the Sands, mm -hmm. where I was working. So now I'm growing this relationship with Casper, with Tilly. And I think in 2014 was Phil Up. 2015? 2014, 2015. And I had just come back from doing a job in Italy for MTV. And when I landed, I went to the dome because over the two, three weeks when they were busy promoting it, I was like, Tilly, please give me a job. I want to work. I just want to learn. You don't have to pay me. They said, ah, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing. Nyalwa. I went there, went to the dome, got backstage, and um, I went to Kapo. Kapo was busy with something. I think he was doing the merchandise, T-shirts, whatever. So I was just folding there, just like volunteering <laughs> myself. Mambonu Tilly. And I said, Tilly. I want to work. He said, Joe, I don't have anything for you to do, but it's fine. Stick around. Then I saw the white guy. I said, the white guy? That's the guy I need to go talk to because the white guy will hear me. Went to Gareth. He was running the stage. He built the stage. He's the one that's like been doing, he did the first three stages. Amazing, amazing guy from Formative. And um, they were having a conversation about a quick change that Casper had to do for him to get clipped onto his harness to do that Kanye West lift. Not the Kanye West lift, it's the Casper lift. <laughs> he did it first. So um, in that moment when they were trying to figure out how they're going to get him out of the one outfit into the next, I was like, no, I can help. Who's doing wardrobe? And they said, oh, no, Spike. I said, Spike, doing wardrobe? No way. Call Spike. Yo, bring, when you bring the suitcases, blah, 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 please bring hangers, please bring this. So then I appointed myself as the wardrobe assistant. So in Casper's changing room, I was the one laying out all the T-shirts, the jeans, the underwear, the belts, the socks, the shoes. Because I'm a girl, I'm organized, I can do that. And the history or the background in my dancing, because we used to do that for our shows, you've got to do quick changes and all of that stuff, now can help me get into fill-up. So when we do the dome, um, I think we had like 31 seconds to change Casper from outfit one to two to get him clipped onto the harness for him to fly on time. That's where I built the trust with them, because they were like, okay, this girl's in. But now the white guy also got me. So on his other show, he's like, where's Tilly? <laughs> we need her on the show, because of the trust that I built at the Dome. So it's all of this volunteering that I was able to get myself into, and then whilst inside, hey, Juani, <laughs> <laughs> And whilst inside, then grow or build the trust so that they can trust me with more work. Now, so, Matt, you dropped to Nearly Nuggets, right? Mm -hmm. And I think some of the key things that I almost want to, 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 to not even overlook is I think one of the things that you mentioned, and uh, you mentioned it a couple of times, right, about seeing opportunities, not taking no for an answer. And, you know, I think for me, it's all, it, I think for me, it's one of the key things that I always try and communicate across that the best way to ask for help is how can I help you? You know, uh, but now you, you, you mentioned something which is very important, right, which is trust. And I find that it's very important, right? But, I mean, kind of talk on that a little bit, right? Because you are now put in a position where you are a young black lady who is now going out into the corporate world, the fierce world of entrepreneurship, and you need to deliver. How important is it for you your team, but also sort of weaving it in for entrepreneurs to consistently deliver? Yeah. 
I have sleepless nights about this because the, the lay of the land is that the black people who want to give black people opportunities still report to white people. So don't ever take that for granted. Black people in power are under the power of white people. So when you get an opportunity from a black person, you need to work as if your life depends on it because their jobs depend on it. And that's how you build trust with people. Uguti, let a person see you bending over backwards for them. Show that you have called a friend to bring their van to get whatever product you were delivering to that person. Now, I'm a camera. Oh, hey, Ipetri. Hey, Njanjan. Make a call and find someone else to bring the camera, even if it's going to cost you money. Because you need to build the trust within the client base you have now to grow your client base and get new clients later. So I say to my team all the time, guys, we can't afford to F up. We can't afford to, because when our client has to go and explain to the white person why the black agency stuffed up, it becomes easier for them to push for the white agency to get in, the white agency we were fighting to get out mm. in the first place. So every job we do, we see it all the time on the shows we watch, our perfect wedding. Umakoti afige, hey, amatafula are not done. Something as simple as a tablecloth, they don't match. Why? Why are they not matching? Mabumuntu patali with deposit. So what is the excuse? It's because we don't take ourselves seriously. We don't take how our houses look. Ogutu, oh, oh, your house is not clean. How are you going to make someone else's event look yeah. amazing? Where na umutle? I used to tell, like, so see how my hair is right now? I look like my name is Zanele from Mashabatini. And I don't care about that because I don't have time to go do my hair. I have to work. I have to be here on a Saturday doing what my purpose is, and that's to help and serve. So if I chose to go and do my hair, be like, oh, my God, I'm running late. Oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I'm on the way. That means I'm not taking you seriously, and I'm not taking myself seriously. And that's how we need to start treating each other as people who we take seriously, but it also starts with self. So if you can't imagine how you would feel in a situation where someone drops you, I think it would be very hard for you to imagine how the next person who's actually paying you to do something would feel if you drop them. I mean, entrepreneurship is largely glamorized. And I think when we post about the highs, um, that in and itself doesn't show the negative or the bad sides or the sides where you go for weeks on end with invoices that are being unanswered or a team that's, um, that's effing up to a degree. What are some of those lows? I mean, is there, have you ever had, or rather, let me ask this before when we sort of link it. Have you ever had a moment where you just sat there, you're like, as in, don't know what the hell I was doing with this Duma thing. I want to shut down. Two weeks ago, I was Googling how to, how to, what? A CV. CV structuring. I've seen many CVs in my life. But I, my CV right now, I mean. <laughs> and it's really not out of arrogance, right? It's, it's that at that moment, two weeks ago, I was like, you know what? Maybe employment ain't such a bad idea after all. <laughs> because, wow, <laughs> it was like my team decided to strike. To strike over something that the, the business needs you to do, which is submit a to-do list and then submit a timesheet at the end of the day. To-do list in the morning before 10 o'clock, timesheet at the end of the day so that we know how much time has been allocated to clients. Mm. But because of a misunderstanding of that process, and I'll own it, that we didn't explain it properly. One person took it and said, no, nah, man, that's some bullshit. Let's actually, let's show them. And then they showed me. <laughs> and they showed me. And I called. So it's now half past 11. And I'm like, so people don't have anything to do today. What's going on? Called one person. I said, why haven't you submitted a to-do list? Uh, no, I forgot. Sorry. Uh, uh, uh. OK, called the second person. Oh, no, um, I've been busy. Sorry, I'll do it. I called an intern. And I said, Kevin, why haven't you submitted a to-do list? And he's like, no, because they said we don't have to. I said, huh? Who's they? <laughs> Who's they? And he said, no, in the, in the briefs group or whatever. And I said, there's another group that I'm not in now. <laughs> and I said, you know, okay. <laughs> then I spoke to our GM. I said, this is Lindy. These people, hey, what, what, what? She's like, no, how could they, blah, blah, blah. But at that time, I was feeling so betrayed. Because it was like one person in this group decided that, you know what, 
I'm going to mess it up for everybody. And I spoke to my dad about it. And my dad was like, what you must accept is that people will disappoint you. And if you don't accept that, you'll be disappointed. And then he also said, but these people must ask themselves, why is that person, if they were so smart, not running their own organization? Mm. And I was like, okay, cool, I get it. So on one end, he's consoling me with, you know, don't, don't like do anything drastic or whatever. But also on the other end, trust in what you're doing. Trust in the fact that what you're building serves a higher purpose than this one person that wants to try and mess it up. And maybe they're not trying to mess it up deliberately. Yeah, now, he's doing it from his own context or she's doing it from their own context. But at the end of the day, yours as a leader is to convince people of the dream, convince people of the purpose, and then they will serve the dream and the purpose. Because if people don't understand that as individuals, we all have our own issues, we all have our own problems, um, and yours is to try and make sure people collectively understand that our individual issues and problems have nothing to do with this thing that we are building for the future. I had to say to the team, guys, understand that every input you make can either break or make us. And it's now up to you to decide if we're going to make this business stick around long enough for people beyond you to be able to find a Duma Collective to work in. Mm. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than you, it's bigger than us. For an Ogilvy to exist since 1930, whatever. For a great advertising to exist since 1981 or something, there's a billboard that says so. There had to be people who invested their time, their effort, their creativity, and saw that it's not about me today, but it's about a young kid who's looking to be a creative in 21 years time and must have a place to go and work. So it's really horrible days sometimes where people disappoint you. And then you get really great days where people cry when you tell them that they're employed, mm -hmm. that they've got the contract. It happened two days ago. We FaceTimed a guy, well, um, it was a Zoom call, and he cried. He cried because his last year he lost his job, then his mother passed away, and then he's been going through so much, but he's a talented, skilled person who just needed an opportunity, and he cried. Uwuti, you've got a job. It's not even like, a senior hectic job, but the fact that he's got a job is reason enough for him to live. That's amazing. Let's give that a round of applause. <laughs> Why do you wake up every morning? Why do you do what you do? You know, entrepreneurship is hard. I think linking it with this question that I now asked you, yeah. it's very hard, <laughs> right? Why do you do what you do? What keeps you going? It's bigger than me. Um, I think there are 32 people whose salaries uh, depend on all of us. Um, and then their families depend on their salaries. And then their families further impact the economy, right? So I think I want to be the change I want to see, one. Two, I look at where I come from and the people I come from. My dad had 300 employees at some point in his life. And he's a person who only went up to standard, what, standard eight? Standard eight? Um, and then went and fought in the camps. And then worked for the ANC overseas. And then came home and said, I'm going to change people's lives, you know? Instead of, I'm going to steal for my own life. Um, I want to... I want to be the manifestation of what my ancestors were. Mm -hmm. My grandparents worked very hard and they were helping other people. So I know where I come from and it would be remiss of me to not live out their dreams for our family and us and their offspring. So I think it's those things, knowing my purpose and also being wanting to be the change that I want to see. That's amazing. Now tell me this, right? So at some, you went from, so you're a creative, yes. and you did quite a bit within the creative space. Now you're deciding to start a business mm. as a creative, right? And the creative archetype, uh, creative archetype is sort of built up in a certain way. Yes. Now you must deal with accounts. Now you must deal with sending invoices. HR. HR. Yes. How did you start? I mean, did you get funding? Um, 
And over and above that, how did you adjust into running your own business from an operations perspective? Okay, bear with me. Also, another story that's cool. So, in 2013, late 2013, so I, I studied politics at school. I was on a bursary, political science, international relations, University of Pretoria. So as I'm doing that, I'm doing the dancing thing, I'm having fun, I'm also doing the bartending thing, like come home 4 a.m., 7 a.m., I'm going to school, you know? But one of the things I studied was research and just like understanding concepts, knowing how to find information, knowing how to piece dots together. There's a company called Global Access. Global Access had F&B and APSA as a client. But there's a lady called Jolene Martin who I did an ad for once upon a time. So she casted me to do like training videos for APSA with this Global Access team. Okay, cool, so I'm working with them for like peanuts, 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 peanuts. But then they gave me an opportunity to do a research project for the Gauteng legislature. And they were like, oh, we know this girl, she studied politics, and she can like present it, and she knows some people, so it helps. So they put me in as a researcher for the job. This job paid me 90,000 Rand over three months. They asked me if I wanted to get paid every week, and I said, no, it's fine. Um, pay me at the end of the project. At the time, I'm living in my dad's house, I'm sleeping on the couch, I'm taking taxis, the cow train had just started, so at least that became easier. But I didn't want to take this money and go and buy a car, make my life easier, move out of home quickly. I said, no, nah, I'm gonna use this money for something that's gonna come in handy. So to be able to invoice, I had to register a company because if I was invoicing as an individual, the tax on it would have been 28%. So I said, I'm not trying to get my 28% chow, so how do I get around it? Let me register a company, then I invoice like a professional. Cool. So I registered the company, got a bank account with F&B, and then, um, sorry, I know NetBank is the plug here, my bad. Then, no, they're not. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so then I got my, I got my company registered, got a, a, a logo. I just wanted to look professional and, and be able to look like I'm not just a freelancer like everyone else. Then the 90,000 Rand paid out. Now I've got 90,000 Rand in my account by some luck not even just luck, I think it's just the universe. I had worked on a Miller project for dancing. We did the Kendrick Lamar tour, and we were working with Kuli Chana, Reason, Stogie T, all of these people as choreography, um, the choreographers. The guy who was the brand manager at the time, Jean, had just moved to MTV. And MTV needed marketing for an event, Clip Drift Golden Beats. Jean knew that I did this Twitter thug stuff where I was like making things trend and blah, blah, blah. So it's like, hey, we need you to do this like marketing thing for us. Can you handle it? I said, yeah. Then he needed us to become a vendor in order for us to do the job. But we also need to pay for stuff to happen, for the job to happen. Then I must wait for payment, right? Yeah. But I've got this 90,000 Rand in my bank account that I was going to use or I could have used on other things. But because I said, no, I'm going to need it one day. Now is the day that I needed it. So to get 300,000 Rand, I had to spend my 90,000 Rand first and wait two months to get my 300,000. But what it did to the Viacom landscape was show that there are small black agencies that can get the job done without needing to be paid now. So the story there is I used my talent, my skill as an individual to do a job. Then I took that money to start my business. So I didn't get funding. I didn't get a loan. My first overdraft came, I think, three years into my business. And that's because I needed to pay artists. <laughs> One of them was Shimza, actually. Needed to pay artists. <laughs> and I didn't have enough money, so then I was able to apply for an overdraft because of like the good behavior I had with my bank account. So yeah, I used what I got to get money to be able to get what I want. Now, my last question, then I'm gonna open it up to the floor, right? I mean, as black entrepreneurs, from a growth framework perspective, it becomes almost difficult to a degree when growing your business to sort of identify what the next level of growth is. How have you managed and how do you consistently manage to sort of overcome the ceilings at every level of growth? Okay. Do you have a mentor? How do you do it? Um, so I didn't answer part two of your question earlier yeah. about transitioning from creative to business owner. Um, Everything that I had to do as a freelancer, I'm just doing at a multiplied scale as a business owner. Mm. So as a freelancer, I needed help from different people to help me get projects done. That's HR management, you must pay them on time. I needed to pay invoices from suppliers. That's financial management. I needed to do contracts with influencers. That's legal. 
I needed to have a place to work from. I had an office that I was sharing with pop bottles and spare names and pay my rent on time. That's operations. I needed to get paid. <laughs> That's getting my like salary and find like again f financial management, loaning money, cash flow management. So all of these things that I was doing as a freelancer, I've just multiplied and scaled into running my business. So I run my business based on what I know. And then what I don't know, I outsource. So now I can afford an accountant on retainer. Now I can afford legal on retainer. Now I can afford, what else do we have? Website management on retainer. Um, we've got, I don't know, if, is it live? Okay. So um, a lot of the things I don't know, I outsource, but I also function off of my common knowledge, my research that I do. There's nothing that you can't find on Google. Google is your friend. Google is your friend. Google is your friend. Google is your friend. Microsoft Office Suite, also your friend. So PowerPoint, Excel, Word, just knowing how to put together a basic presentation to be able to sell a concept. Just knowing how to write a simple letter, Word document. Knowing how to use Excel and not calculating and then typing the number into an Excel sheet. Equal sum, drag. <laughs> enter so that if you change a number the the equal things like changes so just understanding those basic concepts of how the economy functions how people in this economy function will serve you so well and then now what determines my next i think i go on my own intuition i go on my gut i go on what am i able to do i don't wait for someone to tell me um, I also don't wait to be convinced by what other people are doing. I don't look at, <laughs> I honestly only look at my peers to be able to halala them, not to compare myself to them. So it's because we're like horses with blinkers. You understand? Because it's not looking at what's happening to the left or the right because it will get distracted. So if you're focusing on the food on someone else's plate, the food on your plate gets cold. So I'm not waiting for someone to tell me, humble pagela. I'm not waiting for someone to tell me, nagugudla. I'm not waiting for someone to tell me, now's the time to eat. I'm also not looking at what other people are eating. So I think that's what keeps me going. I say, oh, Duma Collective, we're at 30 people now. Oh, we've got more business. We need 40 people. We're recruiting. Mask recruiter, oh, actually, maybe we need to change the structure a bit. Pause on the recruitment. Yes, I've advertised that we're recruiting. So what if we don't recruit the 10 people we said we we're going to recruit and everyone is clapping hands for? And I can only take on five now. That's my business. And you'll still clap for us because at the end of the day, we're still doing better than what we were doing before. If we're not doing as great as your expectation of us, <laughs> I'm so sorry. But <laughs> let's check what you're doing and let's clap for you then. So I also don't... Um, I don't take to head the opinions of people who are not doing it. Because there will always be people talking. I think you need to say that again. Yeah, I just did. Just, <laughs> I, I don't take to head the opinions of people who are not doing it. And I actually tweeted something yesterday. Um, so there was a tweet that said, what, what, okay, I can't explain it, but the, the moral of the story was, if I had done what people told me to do, which was, no, you're, you're doing too many things. You need to be known for something. You need to specialize in something. And I was being told by really senior, knowledgeable business consultants saying, you need to be known for something. I was like, nah, I mean, I don't really want to be known for one thing. I want to be the fixer for a lot of things. So I think that's what I'm going to go with. And I stuck with that. Had I not done that four years ago, come COVID last year when I've got 363 rand in the bank account with 12 days to go till payday, I wouldn't have survived because we wouldn't have known how to try something else or focus on this other area that we do because we do events, we do talent management, we do influencer campaigns, we do social media management, we do PR, we do... Now, because we're not a specialist agency just for PR or we're not a specialist agency just for events, if we were, we would have shut last year. If we only did events, imagine we only did events. Ma 27 March, lockdown. I can't quickly convert into someone who can produce a TV show called Lockdown House Party and save 465 DJs. You understand? So if you're going to listen to what people who are not doing what you do have to say and take it to heart, 
you're going to have problems. And just one last one. I mean, you're largely regarded as... Let's give her a round of applause. So, but these are the figs. Ulakash. How did that come about? Someone take that this side. Um. Okay, cool. Maybe let's, uh, let's get Chris to the ladies. I'll quickly tell you, the fixer came because I was watching Scandal US and I fell in love with how Olivia Pope did things. And then I just changed my signature and I said, hey, I'm the marketing fixer. And then it stuck. So that's how we're here now. <laughs> Hi, Sibu. Hi, everyone. Um, financial literacy is quite vital, and I think it's something that we want to push because it's something that we are not taught in high school. And in the industry that you're in, and you've received the 90K of which you could have misused it, but you just decided to invest um, in your business. How do you discipline yourself? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll tell you, I, my first car was a Ford Figo. Very affordable. My dad, who likes things, loves things. I saw my dad go from driving an S500 to taking a taxi because of mismanagement of money, one, two, of aspiring. And I mean, he deserves everything that he wanted. But when life happened, he wasn't ready to adjust to it at that time. Now, he's back. <laughs> but... I think going through that lived experience as a child, it put the fear of God in me to say, if you don't have it, don't spend it, plain and simple. And I saw my friends getting weaves. I saw young girls, hey, doing a whole lot of strange things for a little bit of change, you know? And to have Brazilian weaves and Peruvian weaves and all of that, I was like, yo, I'm not going to be taking a taxi with 4,000 Rand worth of hair on my head. It makes no sense to me. So it was just that thing of not liking things um, that said to me, you don't spend money that you don't have one. Not saying that credit is bad. Good credit is good. It also assists with cash flow management. But today, I'm dressed in a hoodie with my name on it. I'm wearing really affordable jeans. I bought these shoes maybe three years ago at like, what are those? Those, very, those, those with lots of shoes Marana in them. Start. Not even Maranastat, but like... <laughs> Lots of shoes. <laughs> but the, the thing is, I also enjoy luxury. I would, I would rather fly to Hong Kong on a business class flight or ticket wearing Itegile 400 rand. Because the experience for me of being in Hong Kong is opening my mind. I'm resting. I'm living it up. Um, versus having... 3,000 rand shoes on my feet. That's, but we all like different things, so I'd never judge the next person for doing that. But where the financial management thing comes from is that I don't like things. I need to get things done. I'd rather... I, I can't be embarrassed by someone not getting their salary on the 31st. Because now I live in a nice house, but... I'll go spadal. Busy at Twitter. I'll go spadal. You know? So it's, it's that thing. Nsaba... I'm ruining people's lives, and two, I don't like things. Hi, Sibu. Okay, sorry. Oh, I am Dumela. My question is that, so is it important to say, hi, I am Sibu from Dumi Collection before you start a business? In fact, my question is that, is it important to build a reputation before you can start a business? Thank you. Hi, Dumelo. Clearly, I need to do a better job of branding because it's Duma Collective, <laughs> so people can get to know the name. But um, I, look, people have different business models. Um, my marketing model is word of mouth, is being top of mind um, because I've always aspired to being a top of mind solution to people when they have a marketing problem. So when someone says, I need to fill up an event, who do I go to? 
they must think of Duma Collective because why? We filled up the dome, Orlando, FNB, Music is King, Homecoming, DSTV Delicious, we've done that, you know? So I, I speak loudly about it and boldly for two reasons. One, I want black girls to see that there are black women who can do it, so that means I can do it. And two, I want the market to know that there is a Duma Collective that exists to solve these marketing problems. So the, the reputation thing um, also puts fire up my ass for me to work hard because I want a good reputation, so everything we do must be good. Otherwise, if we do something bad, someone's going to speak and say, ah, no, don't trust these people. So it really, yes, Kutaza and I, Uguti, at Duma Collective, we do good work so that other people can say we do good work. And if someone says we do bad work, then it's a subjective opinion because we've done everything we can to do good work. But if we've done bad work, then we must also own it and say, oh, that was a shit project. So yes, a reputation is very important for me. Cool. Thank you. Sir? Um, hey, Sibu. Uh, I literally thought I was going to stream this whole thing up until I saw your name on the list. I was like, I'm coming here. You risked it all? I risked it, yes. <laughs> so... Um, Look, I think it's really commendable how you've managed to wear all these hats and how you've managed to scale yourself. My question is, like Ojabu or Nabo Winterfell, they, like you have, you are so far away from all these resources, but then you're a creative, you're interested in putting people on, but then where do you start for monetize the passion is a how? utilizing yourself as, as, as a resource and not necessarily go out and seek capital. I think that's what you've managed to do so well and I think you can, yeah. So hypothetical situation. Um, Ujabu is a graphic designer. Utlali Winterfeld. Ujabu une laptop. Um, has access to internet maybe? Let's, very basic internet. Okay, cool. In Winterfeld, there's a school there's a bakery, there's a butchery, there's a library, there's a hospital clinic, there's a clinic, there's a petrol station, there's, there are businesses. All of these businesses need graphics. <laughs> All of these businesses need some kind of marketing. They need what you have, Jabu. They need your graphic design skills. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna go to all of these businesses, say San Bonani, my name is Jabu, I do graphic work. I want to offer you one design, 100 rand. I don't need a lot, just 100 rand so that I can show my work to you. What does Jabu do? Go to all these 10 businesses, 100 rand times 10 is 1,000 rand. That's graphic work, graphic work. Take that 1,000 rand, use 200 of that, go to Pretoria town. In town, there are 6,000 more of those businesses. Go and offer your services for 200 rand. Now you're making 2,000 rand off of 10 people. Then you further expand like that. I think what we, what we tend to do as a Bantu is box ourselves into our environment and make our environment the end all and be all of our possibilities. And we are robbing ourselves of exploring and trying to tap into the opportunities that exist beyond what we see other people have done with their environments and their opportunities. So just because AC we grew up in town, Beria, mind you, one of the most dangerous places in South Africa, I believe, um, but for all intents and purposes, town is a very accessible place to a lot of resources and things, and then moved on to Centurion, and then moved to Sunning Hill with my dad, I obviously had better access to things in the north. It doesn't mean that a person of Lale Winterfeld Epitori doesn't have access to opportunities within their space. Look at what he's done in Tembisa. You look at a Lekau, Opume Machochombin, was the Ivory Park, and look at what he's managed to do. So where you come from, and it, it really sounds privileged from people who have come out, but the fact is there is evidence that it's possible where you come from cannot dictate you staying there. Okay, it's a lady, definitely. <laughs> okay, hello guys, how are you? 
Um, my name is Jabulil, and um, just hearing you speak, Sibu, I just feel like I could just have the whole day with you. I love it when people share information. So my question is, I heard that you said when you were with FNB and you decided you had to um, register a company. I just want to find out what was the importance of it because I work in an industry where I get funding almost all the time. And when I need to come back to Elokshini and get suppliers, when it comes to intellectual property and registrations and documentation for companies, there is no one. So just for credibility, I work with Italtile, I work with Isidingo, and I work with Secologistics. So those are big companies. So whenever I need to come back here at Lokshin and look for SMMEs who would be offering a service to those companies, their documentation is not existent. So I just want to find out what was the importance of you to make sure that you register your company and it is credible. Can I tell you the long and short of it um, was I wanted to be able to answer a white person <laughs> when they asked me if I have these things. I think, and it's, it's a very painful truth, Oguti. It was for me to live up to a white person's standard. Sadly, guys, and you're never going to fight, or okay, for now at least, we can't fight it. The economy functions the way the economy functions. A business wants to work with business. We don't want to be paying into Jabulile's personal account at F&B and then trust the to Jabulile's or Tata Lemali ayo deposit a truck to deliver the call, what, 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 what. If it's not a business, it doesn't matter how it's being run. If it's not a business on paper, it becomes very difficult to entrust it to an individual. One, two, tax law also dictates that if you are paying individuals, you must withhold 28% of that. Now I must go do this admin of reporting to SARS, this 28% and what and what and IRP fives, etc. So learn the industry that you're working in and learn how it works so that you can be able to participate in it in a way that won't rip or, or rob you of um, opportunities because you were not ready. Half of South Africa's celebrities don't have companies. They are busy invoicing a makamawabo. That's why they owe SAR so much money. And it's just like, guys, what are you doing? And I, like, even with us, with the talent that we manage, we pay into business accounts because we want you to be able to pay yourself a salary every month, work like a business, so that you can look like you function like every other citizen of the Republic of South Africa who is tax compliant, who is able to get a bond when you go and apply for one. Because if you're busy as an individual, if I run, I'm trying 100 run tomorrow, 50 cent the other day, banks are going to look at you and not take you seriously. So mine is to just, just be compliant. Just be compliant, do the basics. If you're a serious business person, whether a freelancer, whether you're running an operation with 300 people, register a company, it doesn't cost you much. Go to CIPC, stand in the line for one day. It's one day admin. Register your company, get a bank account, get a tax clearance, get a PAYE number, get labor law certificate, and just be compliant so that these opportunities don't miss you. Also, I think a challenge to use this job would be run workshops for how people in Lokshini can be compliant because also people don't know. There's no course in high school that says, or in accounting, even just in accounting or in life orientation. They don't say, this is how you register a business. This is what you do. Three names. Wah, wah, wah. You know this information. People in this room don't. So if we can just run workshops or we put up posters like Lokshini to say, to be compliant. Your business must be A, B, C, D. Omutayos funeli information nige. Something. And join us for tea. Gives these kind of info, like this kind of information. Also, Google is your friend. I'll keep saying it. The last one. The last one. Hi, I'm Lungelo. I'm fascinated um, about how confident you are. So I just want to know how do you build your confidence and um, because there might there might be someone who who is really uh, into something or onto something but because of the circumstances or maybe the situation the person is growing under may not have the confidence so how how do you build your confidence where do you get it thank you <laughs> thanks Lungelo. Um, I'm not a psychologist, so I can't give you a, a scientific answer to it. But 
I think, hi, Joe. Um, me and Papa Guam comes from gro as a, like growing up, being on stage, being a dancer, all of those things. So I think that contributed a lot. Um, if you look at a lot of kids who played sport growing up, team sports, individual sports, a lot of them have confidence. If you look at people who participated in choirs and, you know, so at our level now, how do we influence the next generation, our sisters, our brothers, our nieces, our nephews, our kids, put them into situations where they have to perform, force them to train that ability. But now, as we are grown, what I used to tell my kids when I, like the kids I used to teach dancing is, the people you are performing to don't know what you're going to show them, okay? When you're saying a speech, people don't know your script. So you can't be wrong, right? You can't be wrong because they don't know what you were going to say, so there's nothing for them to mark you against. So as a person who's developing an idea, as a person who must present a concept, as a person who must go and speak to people, as a person who must go and sell to people, go in there knowing that people don't know what you're going to sell, so you can't be wrong. And I hope that can help you develop the habit of being confident in your idea, being confident in the fact that you know what you know, being confident in the fact that there's somewhere that this empowerment is coming from. The fact that you've, you've had the idea in the first place is already amazing. The fact that you've been able to think of something is already amazing. So Utabantu could judge you, Utabantu could put you down. Man, that don't matter. Mina, I know myself. I know that my ideas come from somewhere great, and that's all that matters. Let's give Sibu a round of applause. Thank you, thank you.